that there is uh, water ice, uh, and that's found both in the polar caps on both the North and the South Pole. And then we also know that there's ice underground, um, you know, just you know, a few centimeters uh, beneath the surface, extending certainly as far south as about mm, 40, 35, 40 degrees of the equator, and potentially further. There are some folks who have identified what they think is maybe dirty snow, <laughs> snow protected by a layer of sediments on top of it, even closer uh, to the equator. And we, well, there's also water vapor in the atmosphere. There's also water ice clouds. But what we don't know is, is there ever liquid water, either for small amounts on the surface as frosts might briefly melt, or perhaps underground. We've not sent instruments that are well equipped to understand whether there are aquifers. In terms of the amount of frozen water, it's been best characterized via uh, radar. Uh, instruments which have characterized the volume of ice at the poles by measuring the thickness, seeing that, quantifying it, uh, also using laser altimetry data to, to further pin that down. Um, that the radar has also allowed the detection of the underground ice in the mid latitude uh, regions. And then one other thing that we have is neutron spectrometers that detect the amount of hydrogen, sort of the upper meter of the, the, the surface. So these are the tools that we have for water so far. There's more to do. We've not sent the kinds of um, electrical and magnetic sounding instruments that would, would look at electrical resistivity from the ground uh, to get at whether there are things like aquifers or small amounts of liquid water. Those are measurements of the future. Water in liquid form has a really telltale signature. So does water in ice form, but water in liquid is a very telltale signature that if you're at small scale, you can use these electrical and magnetical, magnetic measurements from the ground to sense uh, aquifers that are possibly you know, tens of meters deep and that may be hard to, that are hard to impossible to detect with some of the other techniques that we've already done. So I, I think that's a big question of the future is what's happening on Mars underground um, and is there still water? Well, I think the closest thing to Mars on Earth is the Antarctic dry valleys. Why? Because it's cold, uh, but also because it's dry. It's a dry, cold desert uh, environment. So that's the closest thing we have here on Earth uh, for, for Mars today. And, you know, during the Antarctic winter, the temperature range is actually not that different. <laughs> and um, some of the seasonal processes that happen during the Antarctic summer are probably very similar to what happens on Mars. We have a higher atmospheric pressure on Earth, so it's easier for liquid water transiently to exist. On Mars, it would pass straight, in most places on the surface, it would go straight from ice to vapor, whereas in Antarctica, because of the, the pressure, we uh, it goes, you know, solid liquid vapor. Um, but otherwise, the so Antarctic dry valleys is definitely the best. We have other analog environments too, though, um, that maybe have simulated other times and places uh, in Mars history, for example. Um, areas in the Arctic or Iceland, where you have these volcano ice interactions involving uh, water. I think these are analogies to Mars, maybe in its ancient, in its ancient past. Yeah, the physics, the chemistry, and the geology are largely the same, which is, you know, I mean, great. <laughs> it lets us, of course, apply all of our same scientific tools and knowledge that we have on Earth. Uh, to, to Mars, I mean the big, um, the big differences, um, I mean center around differences in kind of the fundamental parameters, like the size of Mars uh, is is different. It's significantly less, smaller diameter, less massive. Um, the atmospheric composition is of course different. Ninety six percent CO two, very thin uh, though atmosphere, and. Um, the chemistry, the starting chemistry of the rocks is different. The bulk chemistry is just a little bit different. It's you know, basaltic rocks like you might find from a volcano in Hawaii or Iceland or India, but uh, with a bit more iron. So how does that affect the system as the reactions go on? So it's the same. You can, one can apply the same physics, chemistry, geological principles, um, which is what makes it familiar. But then there are these differences that make it foreign. And as you point out, no plate tectonics. Um, as near as we can tell, Mars, at least for the last four billion years, has had no mechanism to recycle 
uh, its crust once formed back into the subsurface. So then you have to step back and think about, okay, well, what are the, what are the consequences uh, of that? And I think there's some pretty, there's some pretty big ones. Mars like hovers right on the edge of being able to support liquid water right now, you know, as essential for life. So, and, and, and you know, in my opinion, any smart life on Mars, <laughs> even if you're a microbe, you have to be a little smart. You'd be, uh, be underground to be out of the radiation uh, environment at the surface. The thin atmosphere doesn't protect Mars as well as Earth. So, out of the radiation environment at the surface, out of the the, the danger of being dried out <laughs> by the temperature cycling and by, by freezing. So uh, if, if Mars's right, surface is right on the edge right now and any smart life would be underground if there were water underground, which is one of the major um, outstanding questions. But as we've looked in the past, I think one of the major discoveries of the last decade has, has been definitively, we can say Mars was habitable. Mars hosted habitable environments up till certainly about 3 billion years ago and maybe maybe even longer, up until two billion years ago, at least transiently. There were lakes, there were rivers, there were hydrothermal systems, and these were fairly widespread. They weren't rare, they were common um, that these were, were all across Mars. So Mars was definitely once a habitable world that was a lot more like Earth. There are two big questions for Mars. One is, why could it be habitable at all? It gets, you know, about 40% the solar flux, so it's quite cold, so you need something <laughs> to produce a, a greenhouse effect on, on Mars. Maybe more on that in a moment. I think we're starting to get some hints of what that could be. The other piece is, okay, given that it once did have these habitable environments, what changed? Why did it stop? Why isn't it like Earth and it still has these? I think for the latter, I, I really do think the progress of the last decade is, has gotten us most of the way to answering that question. Um, I think it's a combination of two phenomena. One is that Mars is continually losing its atmosphere to space. And so when volcanic activity shut off and there was no longer volatiles coming from the interior that were released as volcanic gases to help um, sort of replenish the atmosphere against loss to space, the, the pressure overall declined and, and uh, water was lost as well and then it dried out. I think there's another huge effect, and I worked on this with a student of mine, Eva Scheller, we, we quantified that actually every time you have a water rock reaction, you create a hydrous mineral, a mineral that has OH or H2O in its structure, you actually take that water out of Mars's hydrologic system and you trap it in the rock. And then there's no plate tectonics to recycle it back out through the volcano. So actually the chemistry, the water rock reactions that are forming this record of what the environments were through time are actually at each moment taking water out of the climate system and putting it in the rock. So it's having this effect of drying out Mars over time. And, and we think that this had as big, if not bigger, an effect uh, than the loss of Mars's atmosphere to space is the one-way uh, trapping of water in Mars's crust to dry it out through time. And water is a greenhouse gas also in the troposphere, so, so this can also have a cooling effect over time as you take water out of the climate system. So it's just one of these things that um, illustrates how something that most of us don't think about in their everyday life, <laughs> plate tectonics, right, may actually be essential for keeping those conditions over time that um, support habitats. Well, I think the answer is we don't really know. I, we, one of the things that's most exciting, um, I guess, about the, the Curiosity rover mission in particular, um, but some of the measurements of meteorites and of other missions beforehand, is that we've actually found in the surface, in the soils, and in the rocks, um, fairly complex uh, organic matter in terms of being able to host all of the building blocks for amino acids and protein in those things that, you know, constitute life as we know it. And we also see from as near as we're able to characterize these organics that they have undergone chemistry and complex reactions on Mars. We haven't seen anything yet that's like, oh yes, this was life. But we've definitely seen evidence for complex organic chemistry. And moreover, there are organics and those building blocks are there for life. So I think we're in the process now of taking those next steps in terms of are there modern habitats on Mars that do have liquid water that we should go to to access to look for life because so far we have not actually 
gone to a place that allow, has allowed us to drill any deeper than this <laughs> to, to get at any microbes that might actually be in the presence of, of liquid water. So for, for modern life, I think we're still looking. And um, the same is true of ancient life. But the organics testify to the fact that, number one, there were organics on Mars, and number two, there was some quite complex chemistry going on. Rocks can tell the story of climate and can tell the story of habitable environments because by looking at the particular minerals um, and which ones are there and which ones are not there, you can get at things like not only was there water there, but what was the temperature of that water? What was the pH? Was it the fluid oxidizing or reducing? Uh, so, so those are some of the things um, we can also get at what was going on deep in the Martian interior. How do volcanic processes uh, work because by looking at you know different mineral assemblages of these high temperature minerals formed in volcanism, we can get to uh, questions about well from what depth did the magma erupt? What temperature uh, was it at uh, when it erupted? And then there's even more profound questions you can ask when you get these rocks into into laboratory uh, with isotopic instruments in terms of figuring out um, you know what what were the building blocks of Mars by, by these isotopic ratios we can trace. Well, how much of Mars was derived from the outer solar system versus the inner portions of the solar system and kind of get to the planetary formation sides of things as well. And I think also most importantly, when we get rocks into a lab, we can, we can age date them. We can look at particular isotopic ratios of parent-daughter products from <laughs> radi radioisotope decay and get at not only what was happening on Mars, but when was it happening on Mars and how quickly did things change as a function of time? A lunar Trailblazer is a small satellite mission to the moon and our goal is to understand the form, distribution, and abundance of lunar water as well as the lunar water cycle. And now it may actually surprise people <laughs> that there is water on the moon. And uh, that is exactly what we're going to study is to understand that cycle. We know that there is water ice at the poles of the moon, at least in certain locations in certain places, but we don't know how much ice, we don't know exactly where it is, and we don't really know how it got there yet. So these basic questions of making maps of how much uh, for water ice is something we're doing. And then a recent discovery from early from the uh, late 2000s was that even the sunlit side of the moon has the spectroscopic signature of water. But we don't know also exactly why is it there? Does it vary with time and temperature as the moon heats and cools? So Lunar Trailblazer is going to be ma making the best orbital maps of uh, lunar water temperature at the same time, rock composition at the same time in order to understand these questions about the lunar water cycle. Day-to-day -day work can entail many, many things from working with engineers on an instrument design or understanding the calibration of a particular instrument as we're getting ready to launch for Lunar Trailblazer, or it can involve um, working on data from the Curiosity and Perseverance rovers that basically, you know, every day <laughs> comes down to Earth and needs some analysis, uh, analysis of, well, what are we seeing? And what does it mean for the plan for where we drive next or where we make the next, the next measurement? And, um, you know, I fold that into my day job of, of teaching as a professor and advising and mentoring students and research. So, um, yeah, it's pretty fun, uh, the typical day in the life of getting to explore, explore planets for your job. Is it always exciting when you find out something new about a, an outer body or is, do you get used to it? It's always exciting. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think we all get used to it a little bit, but um, I mean, I, 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 that excitement of having the discovery is, is really what um, motivates me to stay in this field. I think it motivates, you know, I think it's what we, all of us are curious about is uh, what's out there, what's behind the next corner, what's around the next horizon, and you know, what does it tell us about our, our place in the universe? Um, so it's really exciting. Right now we're in a we're in an interesting time where there's this flood of information available, but it's 
how do people know what is quality information and developing the discernment to know, is this real or is this you know, something that's disinformation? I think we're fortunate in planetary sciences that largely the, the environment in, uh, in research and in the media is very uh, open and very focused on communicating accurately scientific information. Now, there have always in planetary science been the tabloid media who takes the latest picture of the rock on Mars and doctors it. So there's some aliens or say, claims that the, the rubbly rock is really like a alien moldy food or something. <laughs> so there's always been, there's always been that, which I think, you know, will always a, a, exist a little bit, but we're really fortunate, I think, to have good um, media coverage of planetary science and good science communicators that really get information about what we're doing uh, out into the world.